Well, welcome there, friends, on this January 10th, 2021. Today we celebrate the baptism of our Lord Jesus. And let's begin by praying together the collect for today. Eternal Father, at the baptism of Jesus, you revealed him to be your son, and your Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Grant that we, who are born again by water and the Spirit, may be faithful as your adopted children. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And together, the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, 
but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. Pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God. The reading is taken from Mark chapter 1, verses 4 to 13. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than, than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, let's face it, not all Christmas gifts are created equal. I mean, some people look at gift wrapping as a work of art, while others take more of an abstract approach. I mean, you have your gifts that are more for the giver than the receiver. Uh, yeah. You've got your gifts that have, um, size issues. 
then those that have uh, date issues. Then you have those gifts that just don't match anything or just don't even match. Sometimes I get one of those presents that just really isn't my style. Groovy. Then, oh yeah, once in a while I get one that's just right. But then there's that one gift that comes every Christmas. It isn't as easily recognizable as the other presents. It gets lost in the color and frenzy of Christmas Day. I mean, while other presents are just torn apart, this one just kind of sits alone and still. Sometimes I forget to open it all together. I mean, really, only remembering to open it after Christmas Day has already passed. Sometimes I just, you know, kind of take a peek and then set it aside with plans of opening it later. But deep down inside, and in spite of how I treat it, I know that this is the most important gift of them all. Of course, the gift is Jesus. And the outstanding news about our faith in him can be summed up with this fact, that when God the Father looks at us, he says what he said to Jesus at his baptism, you are my dearly loved child, and you bring me great joy. God doesn't look at us in ourselves, but as we are in Jesus Christ. God says, Paul, you, you are my dear child. I am delighted in you. It seems too good to be true. How does it happen? Well, let's pray before we look at the Bible. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We are looking at Mark chapter 1 today. We are introduced to the great introducer, John the Baptist. He has the Elijah the prophet look. Check out later the first couple of chapters of 2 Kings in the Old Testament. John wore camel's hair, and his diet is uh, quite different. Wild locusts and honey. Apparently, it tastes like chicken. But John knew his role. He has to fade into the background. After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. He, Jesus, must become greater, and I must become less. What an incredible attitude to have as we serve Jesus. Now, John's main message is the forgiveness of sins. And in some ways, John is your typical fire and brimstone preacher who uses a lot of colorful language when he preaches. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. Matthew and Luke add other things that John the Baptist said to the people. Things like, you brood of snakes, who warned you to flee God's coming wrath? Prove by the way that you live that you've repented of your sins and turn to God. And he goes on. Now, believe it or not, John's message is about the coming of good news. However, there's also a word of judgment and warning. And this should give us a bit of a clue on how we are to receive the word of the Lord when it comes to us through the Bible. There are things that we feel we need but sometimes God shocks us a little and tells us what we really need is something a lot more. 
things like repentance, salvation, and purpose. Our agenda seems to be upset at times when we read the scriptures. But isn't it true that sometimes we need someone else to have the courage to tell us things straight? Cut to the chase, lay it on the line. And that is what is happening in the ministry of John the Baptist. Then, amazingly, Mark tells us that Jesus himself came to be baptized. Now, this is a bit of a curve. It's surprising. What did Jesus need to repent of? Why would he need a baptism for the forgiveness of sins? What's going on? The other gospel writers tell us that John even is surprised. So Jesus explains, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. So Mark, as he typically does, tells a story in very simple language. But there is a lot happening here. Mark is not saying by his words or the action of Jesus that he needs forgiveness. This is more about identification. The Apostle Paul explains this when he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For our sake God made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus identifies with those who are being baptized in the river. He is in fact the sin bearer. Mark saw it as a willing acceptance by Jesus for the path of suffering that he must endure as the Messiah to be the sin bearer. All along, in the gospel. Jesus is identifying with sinners and suffering. In this baptism, Jesus is foreshadowing what he will do later on the cross. Remember what he said, there is a baptism I must take part in. This baptism points ahead to the great baptism that is coming. Jesus will plunge under the waters of sin and death on the cross for our forgiveness of sin. The other thing I would like you to think about is this. These are pictures taken from the Jordan River when we visited Israel a couple of years ago. And I must admit, you know, I've shown you a couple of nice uh, pictures, but I have to admit, it didn't strike me as the cleanest body of water around. Quite muddy and cloudy, in fact. But maybe we can think of it like this. That dirty water symbolizes all those people who've come to the water to have their sins washed away. The water is tainted by all those sinners who've been baptized. But Jesus gets into the dirty water. He identifies fully with you and with me. And yet, because of his sinlessness, he is able to deal with our sin. Then the Bible tells us and when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. The heavens are torn apart. In the Old Testament, there are glimpses of this kind of activity, this kind of language. It's a dramatic supernatural event. And the Holy Spirit comes down and lights upon Jesus. Now, this is a good time to have a Jewish mindset taken from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when 
God came upon someone for a special purpose. This is the kind of language used to describe it in the Bible. Think about when David is set apart to be the next king of Israel. The Bible tells us that the prophet Samuel poured anointing oil over David's head. And it says, immediately the Holy Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him from that day on. David was set apart for a purpose and a mission. This is what happens when God is at work. And so for Mark's mainly Jewish audience, they are making connections. God is now setting Jesus apart for a special work. It's happening now in Jesus. The heavens were torn apart. Now, what exactly did that look like? If we go to the biblical roots in the Old Testament, we realizing we realize what's what seeing the heavens open means. It's not that Jesus saw, you know, a little door open in the sky. Heavens or heaven in the Bible often means God's dimension, his sphere of reality beyond our ordinary reality that we see around us. One author explains it like this. It's more as though an invisible curtain right in front of us was suddenly pulled back. So that instead of the computer screen or, or your TV or, or your living room, or in Jesus' case, the River Jordan and its banks, we're standing in the presence of a supernatural reality, a spiritual reality. Now, I think a good deal of our faith is a matter of learning how to live and appreciate this different reality, which I believe is all around us. There is more to life than meets the eye, so to speak. Sometimes we're given a gift, an experience of God's Holy Spirit. We know that we've encountered the Lord. And it's like the curtain is drawn back and we see, or maybe even hear, what is really going on. But most of life is walking by faith, not by sight or by experience. I don't know many people who have daily experiences of encountering God in a dramatic way such as this. Usually our life is quite quiet. The way Mark writes his gospel account, it's like he's inviting us into the story. He says to us, watch, listen to this Jesus, look at his life, listen to his voice in his teachings and interactions with God and his friends, even his enemies, and learn what Jesus is all about. Get drawn into the gospel as you read it, think about it, and pray through it. Let his words change you and make you into someone brand new. And maybe, just maybe, you'll see the heavens open up. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I'm well pleased. Again, the Jewish uh, reader, you have to put on our, our Old Testament mindset, would connect the dots here. This time, think about the story of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. The Lord says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a sacrifice on the, one of the mountains. Or Psalm 2, the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today, I've become your father. That is why, and I've said it so many times, it is so important to be a lifelong student of the Bible. And passages like this in Mark will jump out at us because we know the whole story of how God works from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. It makes more and more sense. And I have to tell you, I've been doing this for almost 40 years. It's more exciting every day. 
as I learn more about the scriptures. What we're seeing in our passage today is that God speaking his words to Jesus in his baptism is the fulfillment of all that had been promised all along before him. Jesus is in the water, identifying with sinners. Jesus is the one. Mark has already told us us at the beginning of his gospel that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And he is the one who will make those other sinners one with the Father, where we too can know and experience God's love as a precious child. Last part. So we've seen Jesus in the water. Now we see Jesus in the wilderness to be tempted. Again, Mark handles this story with just the bare bones. The same spirit that he'd seen in the vision at his baptism leads him into a lonely place, into the wilderness where he will face all the attacks of the enemy or the adversary, which is what the name Satan means. Again, the other gospel accounts fill in the blanks. This is a classic scene of conflict between Jesus and Satan, who is trying to tempt Jesus away from his mission. So Mark tells a story in very simple language. But just as there was a lot happening in Jesus' baptism behind the scenes, there's a lot happening here as well. I believe Mark is getting us ready for what will happen in the rest of Jesus' ministry. Jesus will often confront evil in his mission. He will cast out demons. He will heal the oppressed. He will also heal the sick and even take on the worst enemy, the worst evil, death itself. There is something obviously behind all of these things. There's more to life than we can see with the natural eye. And so we need to, again, put on our Jewish uh, thinking cap. We have to travel back to the first conflict between man and the evil one in Genesis chapter 3. It says this, Then the Lord said to the serpent, Because you've done this, tempted Adam and Eve, you are cursed more than all animals. You'll crawl on your belly, and I will call hot cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. There's the conflict between the serpent and the seed of Eve. And the result of that is that Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden of paradise in Eden. The result of that is first con that of that first conflict runs throughout the whole Bible. And it runs on today. Now people might laugh at this, but we know that there's something behind all of the craziness that is going on in the world around us. There is such a thing as evil. There's such a thing as cause and effect. So that when people ask me about why things are so bad, why did so many bad things happen in our world? I have to believe that what God had first created, very good, had been corrupted by evil and the sin of Adam and Eve. And we are still feeling the effects of it. It's interesting that in the New Testament, Jesus is described as the second Adam, the man who got it right, the sinless one, the one who is in a perfect relationship with the Creator God. In Genesis chapter 3, the garden becomes a wilderness. Now, Jesus in the wilderness is on the way to restore it all. Follow that theme of the wilderness and the garden through the Bible. 
Remember, in one of the resurrection appearances, they thought Jesus was the gardener. He is the gardener. And he's preparing a perfect garden for us in his eternal kingdom. Our Bible reading today teaches us that God comes down, enters our dirty waters, enters our wildernesses, so that he might restore and make it all right again. That's what we celebrate every time we get together in a service, every time we gather to pray and worship. Tomorrow, in the news, you're going to read about the pandemic and the loss of lives through illness. And you're going to read about violence and injustice and tragedy in our world. But the real tragedy is what is behind all of this. There is real evil. There is real sin. And the only way it is fixed is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Our own sin, brokenness, temptations, all need to be forgiven, restored, and made right through Jesus. It all comes back to him who steps into the evil and sin and hurt and brokenness of this life, just as he stepped into the water and the wilderness and the cross. Because the reason why things are so bad in our world is because I am so messed up and I need a savior. And you need a savior. The world needs a savior. And so we cry out to the Lord for mercy. And at the same time, we are grateful for the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's come to him again today. And let's pray. And let's just stop for a moment, perhaps even close our eyes, spend a moment in quiet, And we need to go again to the River Jordan with the Lord Jesus. And we feel the sunshine on our face as we perhaps watch from the shore or maybe even wade into the water with Jesus. And the good news about our faith can be summed up with the fact that when God the Father looks at us, he says to us what he said to Jesus at his baptism. You are my dearly loved child, and you bring me great joy. Father, we just bless you. We thank you so much for saving us, Lord. We pray, Lord, that we would be filled once again today with your Holy Spirit, with a joy, with a knowledge that even the heavens would open up and we might hear the voice of the Father for us today. Lord, as a church, we cry out for mercy for our families, our friends, our community the world around us. Lord, again, we pray all of this in the very mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And now I'm desperate for. Let us with confidence present our prayers and supplications to the throne of grace. We pray for all those in positions of power, that they may govern with wisdom and integrity, serving the needs of their people. May your reign come. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the church. The sign of your reign. May it extend your welcome to people of every race and background. Father, we continue to pray for the diocese. We pray for Bishop Charlie. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us as a people, that we would proclaim boldly the Lord Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins, Lord and the new life that is promised by the Holy Spirit. Father, for all our initiatives to teach people and to encourage people, to share our faith with other people, we pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. May your kingdom come, Lord. Hear our prayer. We pray for the world and those in our community we remember our government, especially during these COVID days. We pray for wise leadership. And of course, we pray for healing and restoration. We pray, Lord, for this vaccine, that it would be very effective in eliminating this virus. May your kingdom come. Lord, hear our prayer. And we pray for each other and particularly intercede for those who are hurting, for the sick, for those who are depressed, for those who are in fear. Father, again, we lift our families, our friends to you, those people that desperately need our prayers, that desperately need a miracle in their lives. We invite you, Lord Jesus, even now, to stretch forth your hand in healing and in power to restore, to encourage, to save those whom we pray for today. May your kingdom come. Lord, hear our prayer. And gathering our prayers, we pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
and praying together. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for the immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen.
and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Friends, thank you for joining us today. I pray God's rich blessing on this week and the rest of 2021. Bless you.